Welcome back to the Word on Fire show. I'm Brandon Vaught, the host and the content director. Joining me as he does every week is the great Bishop Robert Barron. Bishop Barron, we are always, always, always glad to have you. Welcome. Well, I'm delighted to be with the great Brandon Vaught. Always good to talk to you. How are the kids doing? Oh, we're doing wonderful. You know, it's summer's finally coming back, so it's warming up. We're getting time to play outside. Hey, you How's- know, uh, mentioning kids there, I'm reading um, Joseph Pierce's biography of uh, Chesterton. And uh, I picked it up when I was at the L.A. Congress, but you had said to me, it's the best one. And I think that's right. He catches the spirit. But I, I just finished a chapter, you know, Chris, Chesterton and his wife were not able to have their own children. But yet he had this deep affection for kids and was... It's beautiful, these relationships he had, and he'd write little poems to the kids when they would come to visit him, and they, of course, loved him. And Anyway, I just was reminded of that, as I mentioned to your kids. One of my favorite stories from that book is there was a group of little girls who went to a hotel, and they discovered that Chesterton was there staying at the hotel, and they were big fans of Chesterton's uh, stories and his fairy tales. And so they submitted a note to the attendant asking if Chesterton would perhaps join them for dinner something like that. And so they sent the note up there and they said Chesterton's reply, I forgot the exact words, but it it was something like he was shocked and overwhelmed and excited that they were asking him to come to dinner with with them rather than the other way around. He saw he saw it, uh, being with children as a great privilege for himself rather than the other way. You know what's striking me too and anyone that's been involved in pastoral ministry has dealt with couples that can't have children and and what, you know, a heartbreak that can be. And I was thinking of the two of them. Chester and his wife, uh, Francis, as kind of models there, patron saints yes. of, of couples that can't have children because they they handled it so beautifully and, and they found a way to be very nurturing and all that. So anyway, I, that, that's not our topic today, but I was, I've was i got GK on my mind. Well, good. It's always a good man to have on your mind. Well, hey, listen, one more thing before we dive into the main content here. You recently took a trip to Salt Lake City. Tell us about that. Why were you there and how did it go? I was there for the installation of Bishop Oscar Solis, who um, for about the past 13 years has been auxiliary of Los Angeles. So when I arrived here, he was my colleague and I came to know him and he was named the Bishop of Salt Lake City. So we went up there for the installation. It was my second trip to Salt Lake and both times I was very struck by that city. It's very beautiful, nestled there in the mountains and uh, just the setting of it. And then we were in the beautiful uh, Cathedral of the Madeleine, which is one of the most beautiful Catholic cathedrals in the United States. So it was a, it was a great privilege to be there for Bishop Oscar and to see that uh, remarkably beautiful place. Well, today we're going to be talking about following the right Jesus. You know, over the last couple centuries, there's been a slew of books and research and conversation on who Jesus was. There's been the quest for the historical Jesus, the second quest, the third quest, the millionth quest. And so lots of people are are still, 2,000 years later, asking this question, who was Jesus Christ? Who is Jesus Christ? You recently finished a book by Thomas Joseph White, who's one of the great Thomistic scholars of our time. The book is called The Incarnate Lord, A Thomistic Study in Christology. And that's what I want to talk about here in this episode. But let's start off with a basic definition of terms. What is Christology and why does it matter? Well, it's just the formal study of Jesus. So Christos and Logos, you know, give us a Logos, give us some words or reasons about Jesus. So it's a study, formal study of the life and meaning and purpose and uh, ontological makeup of Jesus. So the church has been Christologizing from the beginning. It's been asking and answering questions about Jesus from the beginning. Why is it important? Well, because Jesus, in a unique way, stands at the center of Christianity. And what I mean there is, unlike other religious founders who in their persons don't stand at the center of their respective religions, their teaching would, or what's revealed through them would. But in the case of Christianity, it's it's unique because he himself, in person, stands at the heart of Christianity. And so from the beginning, Christians have been preoccupied with the question of who is he? Not just what did he teach and what did he represent and what did he reveal? Those are important. But the fundamental question that Christians kind of uniquely ask about their founder is, who is he? That's Christology. 
Look, before we get into good forms of Christology, maybe confused forms of Christology, I first want to ask this question. I know a lot of Christians, whether they be Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox, they may think that all this high-level theology and Christology doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, what matters is just that you love Jesus and you have a personal relationship with him. What would you say to that objection? I'd say it's nonsense. The church has always said that's nonsense. The church is is pro intellectual see and it's been sort of a oh, a flag that i wave for the past 40 years is against anti intellectualism i'm with newman it's a sign of a corrupt church that stopped thinking deeply about the data of revelation uh, if we say things like oh well you know who needs all that it's just a matter of that's almost always a sign of corruption um, think of mary reflecting on these things in her heart. For Newman, that's the model of theology, that we take in the data of Revelation, but then we stubbornly think about them. We muse on them. We come back and turn them over, you know. See, if you say the whole point is to fall in love with Jesus, yeah, right. Well, who is he? <laughs> who is this person you're falling in love with? And why, why would that matter? Why not fall in love with somebody else? Why not make someone else the center of your life? Well, see, if you don't do some critical thinking, you won't be able to answer that question. That's why, you know, this this bifurcation and this this um, um, kind of reflexive anti-intellectualism is not a good thing. Yeah, and I find that whenever that objection is posed, that, you know, it doesn't really matter theology, Christology, that all that stuff. What really matters is that you love Jesus. Within just a couple follow-up questions, you can discern yeah. how it really does matter. Because you can say, well, what, what do you mean by Jesus? You know, which Jesus are you talking about? Yeah. Is he this? Is he that? You know, I must say this. I think you're absolutely right about that. And in my dialogue with um, sometimes my uh, uh, Bible uh, scholar friends, We'll come up against this problem, <laughs> like, oh, no, I, all this theologizing, who needs it? I'm for the, the Bible. As you suggest quite rightly, within about two questions, you'll be reinventing theology. So you throw theology out, you have to reinvent it in about 30 seconds, you know, because theology is just the um, careful, articulate reflection on the biblical revelation. That's all it is. And so if you're a Bible person, as all Catholics ought to be, you will be ipso facto a theological person. Yeah, I've heard somebody say that all people have a theology. Even atheists and agnostics have a theology. They believe something about God, even if it's just that this sort of God doesn't exist. And I, you might say that all people have a Christology. Some Everybody believes something about Jesus, but some are right, some are wrong more to yeah. more or less degrees. So let's look at, at some different Christologies, some different views of who Jesus was. Uh, in this book, you comment on, uh, in a sort of commentary on this book on the Word on Fire website, that it really poses two different competing forms of Christology. One is classical Christology, which looks at Jesus from an ontological perspective, and the other is a more modern or contemporary Christology, which looks at him from a psychological or relational perspective. Now, those are a lot of big technical words, so maybe unpack those two different views of how to look at Jesus. Yeah, good. I thought it was the central theme in uh, Thomas Joseph White's book. And, and just a word about him. I've known him for a long time. He's still a, a relatively young man. I knew him when he was a seminarian. Uh, and he's one of the brightest of this new generation of Thomas commentators that have sprung up widely, but especially in the Dominican order, Thomas's own order. So I, I find that very edifying. And uh, anyway, I liked his book very much, and he covers lots of different themes. But I took as maybe the most important this demarcation he makes between the classical approach with its roots in the Bible coming right to the church fathers up to the high middle ages. And that's an ontological approach. It looks at Jesus from the standpoint of his being. What is the quality of his being? And then he argues, I think quite rightly, beginning with uh, this, this um, seminal figure, Friedrich Schleiermacher in the end of the 18th, beginning of the 19th century. We have a shift from an ontological approach to Christology to a more consciousness Christology. That is to say, the presence of God in Jesus is a function of Jesus' awareness, his deep relationship to, his, his knowledge of God. And that approach, I made that little quip about the Schleiermacher Autobahn, because there's this great highway opened up by Schleiermacher, and I think, I mean, hundreds of theologians, both Protestant and Catholic, 
have gone racing down the Schleiermacher Autobahn the last couple hundred years. And just say, you know, something um, to give the devil his due. Uh, Schleiermacher was very interested in, as he put it, giving speeches to the cultured despisers of Christianity. So he was a, a man, you know, late 18th, early 19th century. And he was moving around in the sort of cultured salon of, of uh, Berlin. And he was dealing with a lot of people who were now influenced by the Enlightenment, and they were very skeptical of, of classical Christianity. And he was trying to find a way, again, to give him his, his due, trying to find a way to make the classical faith more accessible to these skeptics. And so he has a whole theology of God that we could talk about. But his Christology is this consciousness Christology, which he thought would make Christianity more agreeable, more understandable to skeptical people. And that's why, as I say, the last couple hundred years, lots of people have gone down that road with the same motivation to make Jesus more accessible. Um, but a high price was paid. And that's part of uh, White's point. It strikes me that these two different views of Jesus, these two different Christologies are not just a difference in kind uh, degree but a difference in kind yeah. so the the classical christology sees jesus as a unique type of being a unique being much different than our form of being whereas the schleiermachian christology to put it longly is is more of saying that christ is like us in many ways but just to a higher degree he has a higher consciousness of god is that right yeah and, and that's we're, we're cutting really to the chase there because the famous line, I don't have it right in front of me, but I, I think I quote it in my article, is um, Schleiermacher will say that Jesus is like us in his you know, humanity. He's, he's like all of us. What's distinctive about him, he says, is the constant potency of his God consciousness. So we all have a God consciousness. I mean, he, Schleiermacher thought that was true. That, that's the ground of religion. We all have some sense of the infinite. Famously, he defined religion as the sense and taste for the infinite, right? So Jesus has that, like all of us, but he had it to the nth degree or with a constant potency. See, like for you and me, it comes and goes, you know, our awareness of God. It's sometimes strong, sometimes weak. In Jesus, Schleiermacher speculates, it was constantly present and powerful. Now, okay, okay, but as you suggest, I think rightly, the problem is, does it adequately account for the qualitative difference between us and Jesus? Or is he just like a super saint? He's, he's us now to the nth degree. He's the best example of a great saint. But see, it's like in mathematics, you know, if you're anything less than infinite, you're infinitely less than the infinite. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so, boy, oh boy, was he an impressive human being. Was he the most impressive creature ever? Well, see, Arius said that a long time ago, right? He's, boy, he's the most impressive creature, terrific. Well, the church said la-di-da to that. The church said, well, so what? <laughs> you know, because you've got to maintain this infinite qualitative difference between us and Jesus. And the Schleiermacherian approach, I would argue, and, and so would Father White, I think, doesn't adequately do that. What are some of the practical ramifications of seeing Jesus this way? It's just a sort of super saint, difference, uh, different from us, only in degree, but not in kind. Yeah, because then he's not really the Savior. See, I, I don't know what then prevents you from saying, yeah, that's great about Jesus. I get that. Christians really find him powerful. But, you know, when I read the Sufi poets, I, I get a really powerful sense of God. So I'm going to go with the Sufi poets. Or, no, when I listen to a Hindu sage— and he really speaks to me of the deep things of God. That gives me a richer sense. I read Khalil Gibran's poetry, and I get a really powerful sense of God. Or, you know, press it. I read Walt Whitman, <laughs> as a lot of people in the 19th century, the, the high romanticism uh, uh, would have said, yeah, Walt Whitman gives me a richer sense of God. See, what prevents you from making those moves if you're basically within a consciousness uh, framework? Or... Press it even further, you know, Francis of Assisi, didn't he have a pretty potent God consciousness? Uh, Mother Teresa of Calcutta, didn't she have a pretty potent and constant God consciousness? Now, we can argue all those things, but see, the point I'm making is how do you demarcate between those and uh, Jesus? And I don't think you can do it adequately, and that's the main problem. 
We listen to the Word on Fire show. I'm here with Bishop Robert Barron. We're talking about following the right Jesus. And to use a more technical term, we're looking at Christology, the right and the wrong way to think about who Jesus is. Let's stay on that point, Bishop, of comparing Jesus perhaps to other figures. You made this point in your review of Thomas Joseph White's book that Christians are deeply concerned about the ontology of Jesus, who he is, the nature of his being. But People of other religions don't seem to be similarly concerned with the ontology of their founders. Talk about yeah. that. Yeah, and I think it's a very important point, and it's not it's not the least to denigrate other religions. It's to point out a difference, namely that a Buddhist will be hyper interested in the teaching of the Buddha. You know, the eightfold path, um, the, the the spiritual way that the Buddha found that was useful to him spiritually. And then he said, I think this will be useful to you. And again, I say this without an ounce of disrespect. It's it's the nature of, of Buddhist religion. It's the teaching of the Buddha. And the Buddha, I say to his credit, would tell his followers, don't focus on me, focus on what I'm teaching you. Or by the same token, an honest uh, Muslim would never say it's the ontology of Muhammad that matters, you know. Who is Muhammad? Well, what do you mean? Who is Muhammad? He's a he's a human being, you know, who received a revelation, and who dutifully uh, communicated it to the world. What matters is the Quran. See, if you're a, a Muslim, it's not Muhammad that matters so much. It's the Quran that matters. It's the revelation given through Muhammad. That's why you know sometimes you'll see in older literature the term Muhammadan. You know, the Muhammadan, and and I I get it totally when Muslims they object to that. Don't call me a Mohammedan. I'm not. I'm not focused on Muhammad. I'm focused on what he revealed. See, uh, Confucius. No one's going to say, "Boy, oh boy, the ontology of Confucius is what matters." No, no. Confucius discovered a way, a path, a moral system, right? And then there's Jesus. See, then there's Christianity, which is just a qualitatively different game because. Sure, we're interested in the teaching of Jesus, and we can formulate it, and we talk about the Sermon on the Mount, and we derive a whole ethics from it, and so on. Sure, we learn how to pray from Jesus, etc. But what we're interested in, above all, is Jesus. <laughs> we're interested in him. Who was he? Who is he? And see, I'm arguing here with the great tradition, it goes right back to the Bible. When Jesus turns to his disciples, he doesn't say, Hey, what do people think about my teaching? I mean, I could ask that, Brandon. I mean, I, I could say to you, hey, I gave that talk in uh, Houston or whatever it was. What did people think about it? Do people like my teaching? Do they like my most recent video? <laughs> you could say, yeah or no. Okay. <laughs> but what if I turned to you and I said, you know, I was in Atlanta for that talk. Who do people in Atlanta say that I am? <laughs> what would you do? I mean, you, you'd shake your head and you'd smile and you'd maybe recommend I take a long vacation, right? <laughs> Uh, because that's a weird question. But yet that's the question Jesus asks. Who do people say that I am? Well, see, the tradition has been, from that moment on, intensely interested in precisely that question. And it's one of the, the unique marks of Christianity. You see this, too, among the earliest Christians. You mentioned some of the biblical examples with Paul. At, I'm thinking, too, of the beginning of the Gospel of John, where he's deeply yeah. concerned about who Jesus is, the Word uh, the word of God. But also, we see it in the earliest councils of the church, which don't seem to be too interested in parsing out Jesus' teachings. They're, they're almost all very concerned with these questions of his identity. Isn't that right? Yeah, doesn't it? I, I've, I've always found that fascinating. Uh, so just yesterday, I was at a, a local parish here, and we stand up, as we always do on Sunday, and we recite the Nicene Creed, right? And we speak of uh, this one who is God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father, through him all things were made, etc. Do we say one word about his teaching? Not in the Creed, we don't. Not one word about it. But what do we say a lot about his being? who he is. And that's that's the fruit of these, these uh, theological and conciliar reflections in the early church. They weren't about his teaching. They were about his being. Now, you know, once you get that clear and straight, you can and should, of course, talk about the teaching of Jesus, as the church does. But the fundamental question is the ontological question. And see, thereupon hangs a tail. Thereupon, th there, there is the hinge of the Christian difference. 
I want to shift back to the book that we started the episode with. This is Thomas Joseph White's new book called The Incarnate Lord, A Thomistic Study in Christology. You mentioned that uh, Father White is one of the great uh, new generation of Thomistic interpreters and scholars. Let's look at a little bit of what Thomas has to say on this. Thomas Aquinas, of course. Um, You say in your article that uh, Thomas Aquinas shed new light on these questions about who Jesus is. What are some of the nuanced answers that he gives? Oh, gosh, you know, Thomas is so rich. And in, in many ways, Aquinas, you know, the church calls him the Dr. Communis, the common doctor. He's a touchstone figure. Thomas, I think, with his tremendously synthetic mind, took in the tradition that came before him. And we're talking about a long time. Thomas is 13th century, so he's got... He's got 13 centuries of reflection. And Thomas read the great conciliar texts, the great theological texts of the fathers very carefully. He knew not only Augustine, he knew um, you know, Gregory of Nyssa and Maximus the Confessor and all these Irenaeus and these ancient figures. And Thomas brought it to a level of articulate expression and sophistication that has served the church ever since. Um, you know, one of the great issues... And I love this term because it's kind of there's something magical about it. Uh, the church talks about the communicatio idiomatum. That means the communication of idioms. Now, like an idiot, <laughs> idios in, in Greek has a sense of what's unique to you. See, an idiot is someone that's so turned in on himself. He just lives in his own little world, right? So an idiom is what's unique. Well, this idea is that each nature in Jesus, he's both divine and human, right? has its own properties or qualities. So we talk about what's unique or idiomatic to his divinity, what's unique and idiomatic to his humanity. Okay. Now, is there a difference between them? Yeah, because the Council of Chalcedon said the two natures come together without mixing, mingling, or confusion. Very very important that Jesus is not God having turned into a human being. He's not a human being who turned into God. Rather, the natures remain distinct, right, in their own um, idiomatic quality. Nevertheless, and here's the cool point, the communicatio, is there some kind of communication? Yes, in this sense, that both natures, divine and human, are grounded in the singular person of the logos. What is Jesus Christ? Both divine and human, we say, both God and man. Who is Jesus Christ? He's the second person of the blessed trinity. So the one person grounds and instantiates the two natures, which means now, here's the communicatio. I can say Jesus Christ suffered. You say, well, how how could the second person of the Blessed Trinity suffer? Well, not in his proper nature, his divine nature, but in his human nature, he suffered. I can say God died on the cross. What are you talking about? God can't die, the immortal God. No, not in his proper nature. But in the assumed human nature, I can say legitimately that God, the Son of God, died. See what I'm saying? So that's the famous communicatio idiomatum. Thomas Aquinas brings that to a really rich, high, articulate uh, expression. If you want the details, by the way, go into the third part, the tertia pars of the Summa Theologiae. It's got three main sections, the first, second, and third. It's in the third part that you find this Christology articulated. Look in the first 20 questions or so of the Tertia Pars, and you'll find this this conversation. I'll make sure we I've include now lost the entire audience. I realize. <laughs> yeah, I'm hearing <laughs> a lot of a lot of Z's and a lot of sleeping in the back. Just turned, no, I hope not. I hope <laughs> not because it's it's all about finally the Bible. It's all about this Jesus whom we we find in the pages of the New Testament. I want to get back to what we said at the outset here, that everybody has a Christology. Everybody has certain answers to these questions, whether implicit or explicit. So a lot of people just assume either that Jesus is only divine or Jesus is only human or, you know, Jesus has some mixture of these two natures. And so it's important to ask these questions, even as difficult as the answers might be. Yeah, absolutely. And the trouble is today, see, the Christology that's implicit in a, in a lot of people's minds is eh, great prophet, great teacher. Um, see, and I would say it's the fruit of the Schleiermacherian turn. 
is you say, okay, it's a question of consciousness. Well, I get that. You know, hey, I, I've got a God consciousness, and the prophets had like a higher one, and Jesus, I guess, has got the highest one. He's he's a really high level prophet. Yeah, I get it. But see, there I go back to someone like Kierkegaard, you know, who famously said that the point of theology is to make the faith hard to believe. <laughs> you know, see, the Schleiermacher instinct is let's make it as easy to believe as possible. But the trouble is, when you do that, you end up with a faith not worth believing. You say, yeah, okay, I, I understand that and get that, but so what? We see, where Kierkegaard, the point was, make it hard to believe, because then you got something that's really worth believing. I want to wrap up here with one last question. You obviously would recommend Thomas Joseph White's book to anybody who's listening. It's a pretty high-level text. We'll have a link to it right below this episode. Of course, you mentioned the third part of the Summa, so we'll include a link to that below as well. But for everyone listening to this, uh, maybe who hasn't fallen asleep yet and is really enjoying this, and they want to have a good Christology, a true Christology, a right view of Jesus, what books or resources might you recommend? You know, a book that we used at, at Mundelein Seminary for years, and Sister Sarah Butler, who's a great theologian and a good friend, used a book by Rock Coretzi. Uh, R-O-C-H is his first name, and, and he wrote a book, gosh, I'm now I'm blanking a little bit on the exact title, but, but go on Amazon and you'll find it. Um, and it's a really good, I think, helpful summary of this tradition. Um, but I get other books by Thomas Joseph White as well. Also, I mentioned Thomas Wynandy, uh, who for years was the um, theologian for the um, USCCB, for the Bishops' Conference. Two great books. Um, Does God change and does God suffer? And I don't know a better treatment of, of these issues of like the communicatio. Also, I would get uh, my good friend, Father Edward Oakes's book called Infinity Dwindled to Infancy. That's a line from Jared Manley Hopkins, by the way. But it's a really good survey of the whole Christological uh, tradition. So Ed Oakes's book, uh, Thomas Wynandy's two books, Rock Coretzi's book on Christology, those will all be good. Excellent. I'll make sure that we have links to all those books below this episode at wordonfireshow.com. Okay, well, it's time now for our regular question from one of our listeners. We love to hear from you guys listening to this. So if you have a question for Bishop Barron, be sure to visit askbishopbarron.com where you can record your question on any device. Today we have a Christological question, and it's coming from Melissa, who lives in Oklahoma. Here's Melissa's question for you, Bishop. I'm Melissa from Oklahoma. Um, I'm wondering what your take is on the West Star seminars, particularly the Jesus seminar. And Bishop, maybe before you answer, tell us, what is the Jesus seminar? It's a gathering of uh, uber-liberal um, New Testament scholars who gather on a regular basis to make a judgment about what in the New Testament is historically um, you know, uh, viable and what isn't. And they famously take a vote, and it's a bit like the papal election. You know, they, they put like a little uh, a colored marble or something in a box, say that, yes, this statement is definitely historical. This one probably is. This one probably isn't. This one definitely is not, right? So there's this big drama about, you know, who gets the votes. What do I think about the Jesus Seminar? Not much. <laughs> I'm not a big fan of the Jesus Seminar. Um, to me, it's the historical critical method run amok. Now, that's the method that was developed, you know, in the, mostly in the 19th and 20th centuries, became very popular in Catholic circles after the Council um, that approached the scriptures from a um, historical perspective, which meant trying to uncover primarily the intention of the human author of the scriptures. It tended to bracket the question of the divine author or intention, but look at the human author in his context with his audience, his purpose in mind, et cetera, and to determine what did he mean to convey. Now, is that a, a fine question? Sure, it's a fine question. But it came so to dominate uh, the approach that I think a lot of very important things were left to the side. The Jesus Seminar, I would argue, is the historical critical method run amok. If you want to see it practiced well, uh, read a lot of things by um, Raymond E. Brown or read uh, John Meyer today, maybe. Uh, those are people that use the method very well. Someone like N.T. Wright in the, on the Protestant side, I think, uses the method very effectively. Uh, 
the Jesus seminar is the method sort of pushed to its, I would say, illogical extreme. And we end up at the end of the day with a few little bits and pieces of data. The vibrant Lord Jesus Christ, who is meant to reign over the church and the world, I and mean, he completely evanesces. What we end up with, now read John Dominic Cross, and I wouldn't recommend him, but uh, find out what you're left with, which is a, you know, kind of philosopher wandering around <laughs> Palestine in the first century with an anti-Roman sort of perspective and encouraging the poor people to, you know, rise up. Well, ho-hum. I mean, ho-hum. So that's my problem with the Jesus Seminar. I think methodologically it's very questionable, and then its results are really debunking of Christianity. It reminds me of something you said earlier in this episode about Schleiermacher, that uh, maybe their project was to accurately reflect the real Jesus, but it strikes me that the Jesus Seminar folks are also trying to make Jesus more acceptable, palatable to a, a secular audience that mostly would reject the transcendent, miraculous dimension. But when you do that, much like with Schleiermacher, much like with Thomas Jefferson's Bible, you strip out so much of the color that the Jesus isn't even worth following. Right. So again, you get the Jesus easier to believe in, but not worth believing in. So I, I find with a lot of the more extreme historical critics, and they write these huge books of thousands of pages, and you end up and you say, okay, I followed this laborious uh, discussion. I've looked at your 10,000 footnotes, and my conclusion is, eh, so what? So what? What am I left with? You know, uh, The compelling Jesus of the New Testament I think is far more accurately reflected in the great ontological tradition of classical Christology than he is in this sort of watered down, flattened out, um, imminentist approach today. Well, thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Word on Fire show. We've helped, we hope it helped you to think more deeply and carefully about who Jesus was and is. Uh, again, at wordonfireshow.com, if you click on this episode and then scroll down, you'll see links to all of the books and resources that we've mentioned in this episode. Also, we have just a couple weeks left in Lent here, and it's not too late to sign up for Bishop Barron's daily Lent reflections. You can find those at lentreflections.com. And if you sign up there for free, then every day for the rest of Lent, Bishop Barron will send you a short reflection each morning on that day's gospel. So be sure to visit lentreflections.com and sign up today. Well, thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you next week on the Word on Fire show. Thank you.